Okay. All right. I think we're good. All right. If you take a class with me, you didn't see that. <laughs> with that. All right. So try to keep things brief here, uh, but not so brief because I'm also writing the intro, so they tend to not be very brief. So our speaker today, we're very lucky to have Dr. Michelle A. Rodriguez, who is coming to Marquette University, where she is an assistant professor in the Department of Social and Cultural Sciences. I got that right. Dr. Rodriguez holds an MA in anthropology from Iowa State University and a PhD in biological anthropology from Ohio State University. And her research foci include the evolution of female social relationships, stress, and human primate interactions across the border. She's the lead author of a slew of journal articles, recent ones being from maternal tending to adolescent uh, befriending the adolescent transition of social support, published in the American Journal of Climatology and Comparative Social Grooming Networks and Captive Chimpanzees and Bonobos, published in Climate. Appropriately, Dr. Rodriguez's research has received financial support and recognition from notable external granting agencies, including the likes of Winter Grant Foundation, the American Association of Biological Anthropologists, and the American Philosophical Society. Additionally, in 2020, Dr. Rodriguez was named the Cavalry Frontiers of Science Fellow, sponsored by the Cavalry Foundation and the National Academy of Sciences. And I'd also like to highlight Dr. Rodriguez's many contributions to the world of public scholarship. Her efforts to extend the reach of her work beyond the confines of the academy include a TED Talk lecture, podcast interviews, and public-facing popular science writing. This includes her essay, wonderfully titled, Quantum Chimpanzees Do Watch Primates Change Their Behavior, 2018, which was nominated as a top pick for the best science short form writing. Clearly, Dr. Rodriguez has a knack for titles as displayed right here by the name. You'll also be able to experience this knack for titles should you join us later this week on Thursday at 4 p.m. as part of the University Forum Lecture. Uh, we are proud to be co-sponsoring. We're like basically the sponsors in anthropology. We're the sponsors. Uh, the talk, which will also be your, uh, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez, uh, that title, uh, it's Bonobo Gal Pal Salishim Romances. Something along those Something lines. Something along those lines. Very funny. Uh, also to be matched by the title of today's talk, which is Victorian Lizards and Promiscuous Primates Reconsidering How Historical Cultural Context Shape Our Understanding of Bonobo Sexuality. So with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. I was just thinking that my title was actually a little unwieldy, so we're just going to call it Victorian Lizards. Oh, sorry. <laughs> got yeah, it. Is always got it. And promiscuous primates. Should I aim the clicker? <laughs> All right. All right. So first, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of an introduction to who I am and what I do. Then we're going to be talking about Victorian lizards. I just found out that uh, bearded dragons do have costumes. And then we'll be talking about promiscuous primates, our bonobos. And then I'll talk about some data analysis with bonobo social relationships and social networks. And then I'll kind of bring it back to some social, cultural, and historical context. So first, that's me. So I do research on primate behavior and ecology and endocrinology, and I study primates in a variety of settings. I've studied them in the wild, I've studied them in kind of semi-free ranging conditions, and also in captivity. And one of the things I'm interested about in all of these contexts is how uh, their social environment shapes their lives. And that's because I'm interested in the evolution of social relationships. So I've studied a variety of primates, but uh, these are some of the main characters. So my PhD was on spider monkeys. They are adorable. And they're also fascinating because they have a social organization that's very similar to chimpanzees. All of these primates live in fission fusion uh, societies where they have this opportunity to join different social groups, change different social groups. And what I think is interesting about this is it gives them a lot of choice. So we can really tell from who they're hanging out with and who they're grouping with, what their kind of social decisions are. And that's also a social organization that really selects for intelligence and social complexity. So I've also studied chimpanzees and bonobos and I'll hear a lot about bonobos today. I've studied those in captive environments. And then I've also studied humans, but humans are kind of the most boring primate in my slightly biased opinion. So now we're gonna talk about Victorian lizards. 
So this term Victorian lizards comes from a reading uh, that I signed for my students in sex, gender, and evolution, and I'll talk about that a little bit, but I want to bring it back to where the Victorian part comes from. So Darwin wrote some very important books, and we have this concept of Darwinian sexual selection, which basically means uh, it predicts that there's going to be competition between males for access to mating opportunities, and that females have choice over who to mate with, but in Darwin's framing, the females were kind of passively waiting for the winner of whoever wins the competition. And in that kind of world, uh, well, we'll get to Bateman's paradigm. So that led to Bateman's paradigm. And Bateman uh, basically did these fruit fly experiments. And what he found was that males have greater root variance and reproductive success. And based on that and kind of size of gametes, uh, it predicts that males should prioritize mating with as many partners as possible, as often as possible, whereas females should hold back from wanting to mate with everyone and anyone, but instead prioritize mating with fewer partners, but focusing on high quality mates. And those ideas then filtered into behavioral ecology theory. So in the 60s and especially into the 70s, Hamilton, Trivers, Wilson, all kind of put together these ideas that included inclusive fitness, reciprocal altruism, parental investment, and parent-offspring conflict. And that collectively, as behavioral ecology theory, really underlies a lot of animal behavior research, including primate research. But Darren was an upper-class Victorian man at a point where uh, the British Empire had basically colonized most of the world. And Darwin conceived his theory in a society that glamorized a colonial military and assigned dutiful, sexually passive roles to proper wives. And that's a quote from uh, Joan Roughgarden's Evolution's Rainbow. And I think that really kind of tells us a little bit about the Victorian social milieu that shaped some of his ideas. Unsurprisingly, using that as his worldview, and kind of having limited access to all of the wealth of animal behavior out there, a lot of his predictions kind of centered on what good proper Victorians should do. And so here's this article that I was telling you guys about. Uh, this is something that I signed for my sex, gender, and evolution students pretty early in the semester. And then I just use the term Victorian lizards to kind of describe the concept. So this is by uh, Dr. Amgitka Kamath, uh, who's a herpetologist, and it was a blog post entitled, Our Assumptions Influence the Facts About Sexual Behavior, the Curious Case of Jerry Coyne, Holly Dunsworth, and Enola's Lizards. So this was uh, originally a blog post that she wrote on her own blog, was then republished at This View of Life. At the time, she was a PhD student at Harvard. She's now an assistant professor. She's actually leaving academia soon, but she has a really cool book coming out that's kind of updating some of our theory. So Jerry Klein and Holly Dunsworth were the two people she was addressing because they were in a little social media blog debate over the ultimate causes of body size dimorphism in humans. So Klein is an emeritus professor he writes a lot about evolution. He has some kind of dogmatic views and he studies fruit flies. He argued for sexual selection and human body size due to male-male competition, i.e. men should be competing and women should choose the winner. Holly Dunsworth is a anthropologist. She does paleoanthropology and she strongly disagreed. So she argued for a hypothesis of body size dimorphism that focused on these life history trade-offs where basically instead of investing in continued growth, there's a decision, well, not a decision, but a switch to focus instead on uh, investing energy into reproduction over growth. And that would account for smaller body size without necessarily any male-male fighting needing to occur. So basically, Kameth kind of drops into that social media conversation and she's like, hey, I have this uh, little analogy from lizards. And the nice thing about lizards is, well, I'll explain how we do project some of our own ideas about behavior onto lizards, but they're a little less kind of controversial to talk about than human evolution, which is kind of loaded with so much baggage. So she was doing her PhD on these cute little lizards 
Let's see if I can point. I'm not sure. What the oh, there we go. These cute little lizards called anoles. So they're kind of small. The males have this little dewlap and they like bob their heads. There's a bunch of them at my field site in Costa Rica. And I think the head bobbing is really adorable. But they are characterized as being both territorial and polygynous. And because Camus wasn't able to do the large scale, huge behavioral project that she had hoped, she ended up having to scale it down and combining behavioral data with genetic data, but also a deep dive in the literature. So her big PhD question is, are these lizards really territorial? And so she looked at some DNA evidence and she found out they're not actually polygynous. Females are mating with multiple males. She found that the behavioral evidence is really kind of complicated. There's these complicated relationships between mating pairs, but males are moving in and out of the study area, not so territorial. But the really interesting thing is she went deep into the literature to the earliest studies, and she found out that the early research was really short in duration, had limited sampling. Obviously, a lot of the early studies were, but based on kind of projecting of assumptions, these early studies declared that these lizards are territorial, and every study after that kind of built on that as an assumption. And if you're not testing that, but kind of taking that as assumption, that's gonna structure how you do subsequent research. And so what she found is that these assumptions and this kind of foundation of limited research led to this whole foundation of literature that was based on kind of shaky ground. So that's where we get this term that I like to call Victorian lizards. Basically this idea that these assumptions about the lizard behavior was based on Victorian social mores combined with uh, limited sampling and the behaviors really fit the social milieu of the early scientists doing the work. And one of the things I think is really interesting in this blog post, she describes trying to explain her dissertation to friends and family, and she's describing how these lizards are supposed to behave. And her friends and family were like, that sounds very Victorian. And that's kind of what was an important kind of click for her to realize, hey, why are they sounding so Victorian? And I think this leads to a really interesting question of, where else might Victorian social mores be embedded in evolutionary biology and animal behavior? And so obviously I do think that some of the same processes to some extent have influenced our understanding of primate behavior. So we're gonna to switch to talking about promiscuous primates. So if you've heard anything about bonobos, you've heard a lot about their sexual behavior. They get attention for a few things, sexual behavior, female dominance, and having less aggression than chimpanzees because they solve conflicts with sex. So they have sexual behavior in every age sex uh, combination. Got a typo there. And we usually lump all these be uh, behaviors into what's called sociosexual behaviors. Sexual behaviors that are used for social functions. But a lot of our interest on in that really focuses on female, female GG rubbing, which is basically genital, genital rubbing, it's just like it sounds, that gets so much attention. But the thing is, when we look at comparisons between bonobos and chimpanzees, as well as comparisons between bonobos and all the rest of the primates, their female dominance and overt sexuality is really treated as a primate anomaly. So we kind of assume, well, they're having this same sex sexual behavior just because they're having so much sex. And it's treated as kind of a curious exception compared to the pattern of chimps, male-male bonding and aggression that kind of fits more of those predictions of sexual selection theory. The other thing there is male-male sociosexual behavior often gets overlooked. So uh, my colleague, Christy Graham and I are working on a paper for this special issue in the American Journal of Biological Anthropology. It's gonna be about queer bioanthro. One of the things we found is like, we're struggling to find papers that talk about the male-male sexuality. We've got all these notes. It's like, is there anything but besides the wall? I'm like, oh, we got some Japanese researchers, but that's about it. And part of the problem is same-sex sexual behavior has been really emphasized in bonobos, but de-emphasized in a lot of other primates. And so uh, part of it is how we categorize behaviors in our ethograms. So I'll be talking more about this on Thursday, but uh, we're often classifying it as greetings 
reconciliation, reassurance. And if that's how you're classifying in your uh, ethogram, you're not actually going to be describing same-sex sexual behaviors. And so there's a couple of papers that have come out in recent years, uh, look basically new data from long running field sites. So uh, there's a paper on Cavalli chimps and one on Cayo Santiago macaques, both looking at male-male sociosexual behavior. But the funny thing is, these sites have been running for decades. And it is only now that suddenly, once you actually look for same-sex sexual behavior, it turns out it's actually quite common, actually for the macaques. Uh, those males in that study were engaging in more sex with other males than with females during the mating cycle. And these are monkeys that have humans following them around at all times for like 70 some years. And part of the problem is a lot of research on same-sex sexual behavior focuses on this idea called Darwin's paradox. And the paradox is it doesn't fit sexual selection theory. And so the idea is why would these animals be engaging in the same sex behavior that's non conceptive it doesn't lead to babies. So it seems like it's treated like a problem that needs to be solved. And the way that they solve that problem is trying to correlate those behaviors to some clear fitness outcome. Because of course, why would they be doing it unless it's somehow getting their genes into the next generation. And this is very much an adaptationist paradigm. It assumes that every behavior that we see is something that would have been selected for because it increased uh, reproductive fitness. But behaviors aren't individual separate phenotypes. Behaviors have a lot of things going on that influence them. There's hormones and neurotransmitters and receptors, and then also enculturation and socialization. But the same hormones that underlie same-sex sexual behavior underlie opposite-sex behavior. Uh, that underlies things like grooming. And so if we want to understand same-sex sexual behavior, we can't take it out of the context of these other social behaviors. And we need to consider them within a holistic paradigm where they're all evolving together. So now we're gonna get into talking about some social networks. So uh, this will be some new data that I've just been analyzing. It's kind of exploratory data from an old data set. I'm using it to generate some uh, new research and pilot uh, more bonobo research. But here's the main questions I'm looking at. How do male and female network position vary within the sociosexual networks? And how do sociosexual behaviors vary with the other behavioral networks? And so this was research collected at the Columbus Zoo, which has a lovely group of bonobos. That's Lady over there. And it's old data, as I said, it's about over 10 years old now. It was part of that comparative social grooming project comparing chimpanzees and bonobos. But now uh, I've been looking back at the sociosexual behavior to get some pilot data for uh, proposals. The cool thing about how they're housed is they're housed in a modified fission fusion social organization. Basically what they do is every few days, they let the bonobos choose what subgroup they wanna hang out with. And so it's mostly their own choice. There is one exception. There are two males, Donnie and Bila, that are not putting in, put in together. They are very much spoiling for a dominance fight and the keepers understandably do not want severe aggression to break out. But otherwise they get a choice. And then for a few days, they hang out with that subgroup before they shuffle again. And I did focal animal sampling, which just means we pick an individual for 30 minutes at a time and record all social behavior, as well as every two minutes, record their activity and their nearest neighbor and how far they are. And then I did social network analysis in a program called SociProg. So this was uh, created by a cetacean biologist to look at really complex social relationships. And I'm gonna talk about a couple different analyses. So the first one involved the full social network, males and females, and I did a couple different tests. One was a mantle tests, which is looking at do these sociosexual behaviors vary between and within the sexes? And then I did t-tests and Levine's test of variances on social network statistics, and that's comparing the male and female position in the social network for two statistics, strength and eigenvector centrality. 
So uh, there's slightly different things, but often to sort together. Uh, strength basically looks at how connected that individual's social bonds to, are to all the other individuals. Eigenvector centrality looks at how central they are within the network. Basically, the more central you are with these two uh, statistics, the more you're kind of who the rest of the social group interacts with and kind of coalesces around. And then I looked at just the male-male networks. So I did matrix correlations that look at how our different behavioral matrices for each behavior uh, kind of map onto one another. And then multiple regression quadratic assignment procedure, it's a really unwieldy term. And instead of looking at the correlations, this looks at the co-variation between those multiple networks. And uh, it actually lets you set it up as a model where you can have uh, multiple behaviors kind of all going into predicting one outcome variable. So the way I set it up, sociosexual behaviors was the outcome and the predictors were grooming, social grooming as you can see here, agonism, which includes both aggression and low level forms of unfriendly behaviors like displacement, and then huddling, which is just as it sounds, them kind of cuddled together to sleep. And here we have a social network uh, and our females are in purple, our males are in blue, and then male, male is blue, female, male is red, female, female is purple. So the first thing is that sociosexual behaviors occurred at similar rates between and within sexes. So it's not just they're mostly focusing on male, female, or female, female, male, female, 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 and male, male, male are all occurring at similar rates. So there's some variation, which I'll talk about. There's no sex difference in either eigenvector centrality or strength, which means that males and females are occupying similar positions in their sociosexual networks. But this, there was a sex difference in their variances. So females had a greater inequality of variances. What that means is that some females were more central, whereas other females were more peripheral, whereas the males were more similar in their positions. Let me see. Here is Gilda. She was kind of the center of everything. She was a subadult female that got a lot of attention. But that basically uh, means that for the males, they're all kind of about similar. But for the females, that position may matter more. And so now we'll talk about the males. So I've got all of these different behaviors kind of all piled together in that network. You'll see them separated out later. But first, our matrix correlations. Sociosexual behaviors were significantly uh, correlated with both grooming and agonism. They were not correlated with huddling. So this I think is interesting because if it was just correlated with grooming, we might think that sociosexual behaviors are about friendly social relationships. If they're just uh, correlated with agonism, we might think that it's associated with tension re reduction and kind of tense social relationships but it's correlated with both. Then I did the MQRIP, multiple quadratic regression assignment procedure. And this gives partial correlations for each behavior. And in this only agonism is significant, groom and huddle is not. And that means once you account for how all of these behaviors co-vary together, only agonism really pulls out as being a significant predictor of the sociosexual behavior. And so that generally supports intention reduction hypotheses, but I'll talk a little bit more about that. Since it's hard to see the behaviors when they're all kind of piled up on each other, here they are separated out. Huddling was barely a network, but you can see more of these networks for these other uh, behaviors. And I want to point out to this dyad, Maiko and Toby, they had uh, most of the agonism. They were kind of the drama llamas. I'll talk a lot more about them. But then if you look at grooming, Jimmy and Toby and Vila and Toby have the strongest relationships. If you look at sociosexual behavior, Maiko and Toby again had uh, a strong relationship, but there are quite a few of those. So males and females occupy similar positions in their social networks, sociosexual networks, but females have greater variance, meaning that uh, I think perhaps for the females, uh, kind of, I suspect there might be some dominance relationships going on there too. 
uh, where females are dominant in bonobo society and jostling a little bit more for the males. But agonism best predicts male-male sociosexual behavior, which is likely due to tension reduction and reconciliation. So remember I mentioned that for chimpanzees, those sociosexual behaviors were often referred to as reassurance or reconciliation. Not surprisingly, that's one of the contexts that we tend to see these sort of behaviors. But the question that I'm left with is, are these meaningful differences based on sex or dyad type? When I say dyad type, I mean between male-male, male-female, and female-female relationships. Or are they contextual depending on individual social relationships and histories? And a lot of our research is kind of structured of looking for sex differences, looking for differences in types of relationships. But in these kind of really flexible, complicated social groupings, there's so much going on that has a lot to do with kind of individual relationships and their histories together. And so that's why I wanna talk about one particular triadic relationship that was pretty hilarious, but also kind of tells us a little bit about the complexity here. So up top, we have Jimmy. Jimmy uh, was a mid-ranking male. And then there's Toby and Maiko. Toby and Maiko were low-ranking males. And Jimmy and Toby have a long history together. They're part of the founding members of the group. They actually came over from uh, Europe to the Columbus Zoo when there was just a group of four of them. So they've been together for a while. But we had these kind of situations where Toby and Maiko were basically just drama llamas and always involved in some sort of social drama, both positive and negative. And one of the things I noticed is there was a pattern. What would happen, and this is especially in the afternoons when they're in the outdoor enclosure, one of them would be grooming with Jimmy, the other one comes in, kind of butts in, that starts some conflict. They then ignore Jimmy to chase each other and get in a little spat. And then they make up with some sociosexual behavior. And this would happen again, rinse and repeat, constant drama. But there was one day that the drama actually escalated past just focusing on Jimmy. So this was a day where uh, they were basically trying to involve some of the other individuals in their drama. Most of the adults were not having it. Uh, so there was an adult female, Susie. At one point, uh, Toby went over to Susie and tried to mount her. She just walked away. She actually sat next to me, uh, right next to me at the glass and rolled her eyes at me like she was over it. <laughs> and that's the only time in this social group I've ever seen any form of sociosexual behavior be rejected. But the adults, they were sick of the drama. The kids, not so socially savvy. So what Toby ended up doing is he ended up engaging in sociosexual behavior with Susie's daughter, a little Mary Rose, who was a juvenile. They were right in front of the window, great view for all the zoo visitors. But it was so funny because as he's engaging with the sociosexual behavior, he's not looking at Mary Rose. He's looking over at Michael like, hey, can you see me? Hey, can you see me? And then they'd start chasing and displaying and fighting and then eventually making up. And so it was really interesting that they were so focused on kind of their rivalry over Jimmy that so much of their behavior with each other and with the rest of the social group was all about kind of dealing with their jealous feelings over wanting to be grooming with Jimmy. So uh, I decided to characterize these as bromances and frenemies. So I think the bromances here are between Toby and Jimmy and Michael and Jimmy. And I especially think uh, Toby and Jimmy had a really strong grooming relationship. And I think that is particularly why Michael was very threatening to that. But the bottom line is we've got Toby and Michael have this frenemyship where they have a lot of agonism, but also a lot of sociosexual behaviors. But if we were just to look at dyadic relationships, which, which is often how we look at uh, social relationship data, we'd kind of be missing the context here because to understand that relationship, we need to understand the relationship with Jimmy. And when you think of this as just one triad, when you think of the whole social network, there's so much of those social dynamics going on that it's both amazingly cool to think about. It also makes it really hard to kind of separate out and understand as we're analyzing it. 
So these patterns of sociosexual behavior are highly idiosyncratic, and I think they depend a lot on relation his, relationship histories within that network. And here's where that gets into a challenge of, remember I was talking about generating pilot data for new studies? And it doesn't really give me some good answers for what's the best way to go about further research. Ideally, the plan was to get bigger sample sizes. The plan was to do another social network study at a different zoo, the Milwaukee County Zoo, but also then to get some uh, urine samples to look at hormones. But it reminded me that there's a challenge in trying to increase sample sizes versus keep contextual data. I only kind of know this complex context because I was the one collecting all the data. Once we get to bigger studies where we have uh, multiple researchers collecting the data, if we're not having the same level of kind of behavioral notes in our data, some of that context gets lost. And with social networks, you really can't increase sample sizes by going to another social group and studying them. You can increase the amount of social networks you're looking at, but they're all gonna be their contained whole. And each of those networks has a unique dynamic. And so I think one thing that I've come away from this is instead of framing behavior as, this is what males do, this is what females do, we need to recognize that our social behaviors are highly flexible. They're always changing and they're not always kind of following the rules of how we expect them to behave. And I think if we think back to Darwin, I don't know how we deal with this because sometimes males are competing with access to other males because that relationship with those males is valuable to them in a way that's not just valuing getting the genes into the next generation. And I'm not gonna talk about this today, but I'll talk about it more on Thursday. Sometimes females may engage in sex with other females just for pleasure. And we often, again, try and find a reason why are they doing this that we can explain within an evolutionary context. And so I wanna talk broadly about the historical and cultural context, both about sexual selection theory and about bonobo research. So we're at this really interesting time where a lot of the underlying assumptions of sexual selection theory are really being challenged. So if you remember Bateman's paradigm and the fruit fly breeding, turns out uh, that's been unsupported by new research that tried to replicate it. And this is actually really interesting. They, they replicated the fruit fly breeding, found a different result and figured out why. Bateman using kind of the best technology he had at the time, he obviously could look at genes, he used inbred fly strains so that they had a phenotype that he could see. The problem is he was uh, using offspring produced as a proxy for mating success, but those inbred fly strains, because they were so inbred, weren't actually producing offspring. And so he ended up with a biased data set. Again, a really good study for 1948, but now we have much better technology that shows that when you actually look at the genetics, it doesn't quite work out. And then we've got these other two studies that have come out. I still haven't read them in detail, but we've got challenges to patterns of male dominance in primates. So Lewis et al. recently published a paper that found that females dominant males in 43% of primate species. So that's nearly half. That kind of puts, pokes a few holes in this idea of male dominance. And then just a couple of weeks ago, there's a new study that came out that challenges this idea of body size dimorphism in mammals. And what they found is that looking across a wide data set with a lot of different mammals, males and females have uh, fairly similar body sizes. And of course, we can look at some examples where we do see extreme body dimorphism, gorillas and orangutans come to mind. But again, we may have been taking that as the norm when it may not be so. And I also want to get to this question of why male-male sociosexual behaviors have been overlooked. It really frustrated Kirstie and me to be looking for this data in the literature and not being able to find it and wondering if we are completely missing something. And we've been trying to figure out why, and we've been looking at a couple different ideas why. One might involve homophobia. I'll talk about this more on Thursday, but basically, Part of the reason that we talk about same-sex sociosexual behavior in bonobos is the timing was a little bit later than chimpanzees. So whereas with the chimpanzee research, it kind of got subsumed under other things, the bonobo research was coming out in the 1980s from the wild and the 1980s and 90s 
uh, in captive contexts. And there was this really influential work by Parrish and DeWall that really highlighted female dominance and female-female sociosexuality, and that got a lot of attention. What we think what might have been going on is that that female-female behavior kind of became an object of salacious interest. It becomes one of those big, like, here's a talking point about bonobos. Uh, there's several hypotheses for those behaviors. But one I think is interesting is a mate attraction hypothesis, that the females are engaging in sexual behavior to attract the male's attention, which I think is kind of funny. But also, we think that perhaps male-male sociosexual behavior might have been a little bit more of a threat to heteropatriarchy. So researchers may have shied away from that and stuck to focusing on the female-female relationships. However, there's also, I think, what's going on in artifact of captive environments. So bonobos are only in one country, the Democratic Republic of Congo, because of their kind of history of uh, colonialism and uh, violence and instability that has continued after that. Bonobo research started and then had to pause during civil war and got restarted, which is why there's been a lot more focus on these captive studies. And if we look at the early studies of Franz de Waal in captive settings, I looked back in some of those methods and for some of them, they had really limited opportunities for male-male relationships just due to how the keepers were housing them. So if you only have opportunity for one or two male, male dyads, you're not really gonna have enough to analyze. And it makes sense uh, that the keepers might wanna keep those males apart if they're trying to manage uh, behavior and aggression. Like I said, with Bila and Donnie, they have been spoiling for a fight and the keepers are trying really hard to prevent that from happening. But one of the problems in captivity is because they can't get away from each other, we have to do a lot more to manage their social relationships, which also then influences the social relationships. And that's why wild data would be a lot more useful to look at these questions. But I also wanna talk about the context of when and where we've studied uh, bonobos and how that affects uh, what we look at. So one of the things I've been really interested in the primatology literature, there's a lot about the differences in kind of Japanese perspectives versus um, North American and European perspectives. So the Japanese uh, researchers were working in the wild at a site called Wamba. And one of the things I love about their papers is they have a lot of descriptive context. So uh, all of, instead of just kind of recording the behavior, in the papers that are describing these kind of almost like ethnographic vignettes of what's going on. And that gives us more detail for what sort of context those particular behaviors are happening in. But in a lot of the North American and European uh, perspectives, they've, there's research in both captivity and the wild, but there's a lot of focus on hypothesis testing based on these kind of ultimate functions. And what happens if you're recording in your ethogram a set of behaviors and then kind of putting it into your mathematical model where you run your GLMM and it tells you what's significant, you're getting, if you, you're getting some interesting results, but that's really gonna be influenced by how you structure your study, how you structure your ethograms and how you set up your models. So just like uh, with the Victorian lizards, your starting point and assumptions are going to influence what you find. When we do that sort of hypothesis testing, we are going to only kind of see this outcome that's based on the assumptions of how we decided to structure our research. And so I think one way to kind of get past that is we should also be focusing on getting a lot more qualitative data and also re-examining and kind of retesting some of those assumptions that we use to build uh, our research design. However, there's also kind of a big clearing, clearing hole here. What about Congolese perspectives? As I said, bonobos are only found in one country. I wish I could tell you what the Congolese perspectives are or how they design their studies, but there are not a lot of Congolese researchers uh, being able to get to the position where they can influence uh, the science the same way. And bonobo research is dominated by these European, American, and Japanese researchers. In captivity, that makes sense. We've got captive bonobos in the US and Europe, very convenient to go to your local zoo and do these studies. So that makes sense, but it holds for field research as well. And those are basically kind of part of a larger pattern where in a lot of primatology, uh, people coming from kind of affluent uh, imperialistic nations 
go out to field sites in countries that are poorer, that have had a really kind of often terrible history of colonialism. And what happens is the local people often get employed as field assistants, but don't get the same opportunity to actually influence the science. And especially in some case, a lot of those early research that so-and-so discovered something, it's because the local people already knew it and were telling them, hey, look, you discovered this. And so we really need more Congolese perspectives. And so I was looking for some uh, Congolese scientists to highlight, really having a hard time finding them, but I did wanna highlight uh, Susie Paduenda. Uh, she does research at Lola Ya Bonobo, which is the only Bonobo sanctuary where confiscated orphans go. And uh, they also have a reintroduction program. So there's about 70 bonobos there. So I think she's a really good example of what the future of bonobo research should look like. So to kind of sum up, biases based on our cultural and historical context are going to shape our theories. And that especially includes some of those broader kind of cultural worldviews. And those biases are gonna frame the research questions we ask and the methodology we use to design our studies to test the questions. And we've got a lot of really new research coming out that is challenging all of these assumptions of sexual selection theory. So I think both our lizards and our primates really need to leave the Victorian age, and we need to kind of test a lot of these assumptions to see what holds up and what doesn't. And I think this is actually really exciting because we're at a critical per period for a big paradigm shift. And hopefully by kind of going through this process of dismantling some of our old frameworks, we'll be able to build some better theoretical frameworks. And there's, this is already ongoing. Uh, I've been teaching from Evolution's Rainbow uh, and Rough Garden poses social selection as an alternative to sexual selection, which can basically kind of account for a lot of the things that we do include in sexual selection, but also includes kind of a lot of cultural factors and social factors. I think this concept of social selection is very similar to kind of a lot of our human ideas about biocultural evolution. And one of the things we're realizing is there's so many more animals that are so much culture, so much more cultural than we realize. And so often when we talk about bonobos do this, chimpanzees do this, we've gotten to the point where we can look at Here's variation and say how chimpanzees termite fish versus spear versus uh, nut cracking. But we focus so much on the tools that I think some of those social and cultural traditions are harder to kind of tease out. But those likely are going to influence them in really big ways. And to use one really kind of silly example, uh, one of the things the keepers at the Columbus Zoo told me is that the Columbus bonobos have kind of a culture of not liking sweets. So if a bonobo is transferred from say the Milwaukee County Zoo and they really like sweet things, they will soon learn that the other bonobos don't and then they will stop wanting the sweet things. So if the keepers offer it to them, they're not gonna take it. And uh, the keeper told me this because we were talking about a potential saliva collection where you like crush up candy and put it on a rope for them to chew. And she's like, that wouldn't work with our bonobos because it's the culture that they don't do it. It's just like when you move to a new place and you end up becoming friends with people that are very diet conscious, suddenly you're changing your eating behaviors the same way. And that sort of subtle cultural stuff is going on all the time. And the other thing, uh, Amdika Kamath and a colleague have this book coming out in 2025, A Feminist Science of Animal Behavior. And it's kind of building on uh, the deconstruction of theories that uh, were kind of started with that Victorian lizards concept. And I'm really excited to see how they're kind of rebuilding. And I mentioned that uh, she's recently decided to leave academia. Obviously, there's a lot of factors, but one thing she mentioned is she didn't want to be in a position where she got too dogmatic about trying to defend her own theories, but she was also worried about the fact that it's going to take a while for the book to come out and to have an influence. And to get to tenure, she would still have to operate under these bold paradigms that she's already moved past because that's what peer review requires. And so I think we really need to think about how our scientific structures are often enforcing kind of older paradigms and stifling uh, 
especially early career scientists, from trying to kind of move the needle forward. Final point I want to make is truly diverse perspectives and recognizing how our positionality shapes research can enrich science. Like I said, we need more Congolese perspectives. We need more queer perspectives. And I've written about positionality in international collaboration. Uh, Kirsty Graham and I are going to have a paper focusing on that with gender and sexual identity. But the more perspectives you have from different cultural worldviews, the more it can help us kind of notice where we've got those biases and assumptions creeping in. So thank you for your time. I want to uh, thank our head keeper, Audra Minault, and all the keeper staff for taking care of these lovely bonobos. Uh, my collaborators, Kirsty Graham, Evely Boving, and Jessica Waltz, and a couple of my independent study students, Emily and John, they ended up spending a lot of time reformatting all of this data so that SOCHPROG could work with it and also did their own independent studies. Sadly, some of these bonobos are no longer with us, including Toby and Maiko, as well as Unga and Lady. And also, uh, Franz Dewell recently passed away. And I just want to acknowledge how important he has been to kind of initiating this, a lot of really interesting research on bonobos and making a lot more of the world care about them. Thank you. Now I have time for Q&A, so if anybody has questions, either in the Zoom room, I'll go ahead and monitor the chat for folks here. I have a question. I didn't want to interrupt him. So I, I just want to talk about or, or ask you about um, <clears throat> your perspective on the way sexual selection works. Like normally, traditional evolutionary biology holds that sexual selection is epiphenomenon. Essentially, the, the ecology is driving all of this. So when you see something like sexual selection, sexual amorphism in gorillas or lack of sexual amorphism and, you know, um, gibbons or something like that, that normally is considered a response to something else that's going on. And it's the rational uh, or at least can be modeled evolutionarily as like an, an optimal path for resources and, and reproduction. And so I, I wondered if you wanted to talk about the it was made to say bonobos and chimps in, in that context, because they do have quite different social behaviors, despite they're only whatever a million years separated. Um, I agree. Yeah, right. Uh, and but I mean, they are very similar in size, uh, cranial capacity, all sort of the relevant parameters and diet mostly. Yeah, so I mean, I guess our kind of hypotheses for why chimps and bonobos are different are the Congo River forms that kind of barrier. And in bonobo habitat, there's a lot more terrestrial herbaceous vegetation, basically a leafy diet, kind of what gorillas eat. And it's thought that that would have facilitated kind of larger subgroups. But the differences that we see are uh, bonobos have sexual swellings that uh, are large for a larger period of time. So for chimps, it's only like a few days. For bonobos, it's like full or partial for three, probably about three weeks out of say a month. So there's definitely been that selection for these physiological differences. And there's also some cool research looking at some hormonal differences between the two. But what I also find interesting is we emphasize so much of those differences when there's so much overlap, particularly in their kind of behavioral ecology. And I think part of that, I don't know if I'm kind of wandering from what your question was, but I think part of that is with these kind of highly complicated vision fusion animals, there's so much selection for social flexibility and uh, the influence of kind of socialization and enculturation that we've kind of got, I guess, less set in stone and more shaped by what those early experiences are in order to respond to what the current environments are. Did I get to that? Well, I, I guess um, what I'm getting at is that when things are different, it does require an explanation. In other words, if you see two things are the same, you say, oh, okay, that's not particularly interesting. But when things are really different, it does require some explanation. And so chimps and bonobos, my understanding is just the presence of gorillas that's gonna be the driving factor in why chimpanzees tend to be more aggressive because they have to compete essentially for resources in a way that the bonobos don't. And so all of these behaviors are I would, I would argue adaptations. Like, I mean, adaptation is just kind of a 
a word that we throw around, but I mean, they are trying to survive in their environments in the, in the best way that they can. Their behaviors are not random. You know, in other words, there is an ultimate thing driving them and you can invoke complexity theory of the brain and all of these things sort of interacting, but you know, between chimps and bonobos, the biggest difference is I think gorillas. And so for chimps, it's rational to be more aggressive because they're, they're competing and it, like there's a constraint on their environment in a way that bonobos just don't seem to to have because there are no gorillas south of the Congo, as you, I'm so sure you know. Gorillas love that terrestrial vegetation. Right. So I think I get what you're saying, it, what you're getting at. And I do agree that once we see the range of overlap and we do see differences that still emerge, that does require explanation. Uh, and I think like regarding sexual selection theory, there are times when it does hold and it works well. It's just, I think we need to re-examine when it does and when it doesn't and start kind of modifying our theory to account for, again, those differences. Yeah, I guess my, my question is whether you're, whether you're really challenging the core assumption or you're just honing it. Because I, I looked at that same paper with the sexual dimorphism, right? It's entirely driven by chiroptera, bats. Okay. So in bats, we have a very unusual social environment because they have to hang upside down and they all are kind of on top of each other, right? Um, there are some females that are larger than males, but that like the entire, because there are thousands of species of bat that literally swamps the whole diagram. So if you go to primates, for example, it is not the case, right? And that's probably most relevant to us. So uh, the idea of abandoning, you know, the models of sexual selection, I think, my concern is that you, if you say, well, these are really complicated, right? That's the opposite of what you should be doing. I think you should be saying, let's take it apart. Let's not just assume. And so like the social selection the hypothesis you discussed earlier, you said sexual selection is part of it. And then you have this other thing. I think that's true. So you need to say sexual selection is doing X and something else like that science is reductionistic. So you can tease out the various influences as opposed to just sort of saying, oh, there's this big thing going on. It's so complicated, we can't tell what's going on, but you know, look at all that stuff, right? I, I think that's in a sense, the opposite direction. At least what I would wanna do is say, okay, we see a pattern, let's explain it, and let's tease out all of the various influences. There's no question that sexual behavior, and you know, I, my, my perception is that uh, sex is just another problem solving tool for a primate. They don't have more morals about it, so it's, like they probably don't think of a behavior as being necessarily sexual or not sexual. That's a thing that we impose on them, right? So it's just another tool that they would use in their toolkit when they're either being friends or whatever, making up after a fight, right? Um, so I guess I'm, I'm personally not surprised, you know, at any of that. Um, I am surprised that more people haven't observed male-male sexual behavior because I've certainly read it. I think we've observed and it and it's there. It's just not a study, a focus of studies. I, I mean, that may that may be true. Uh, I don't know if I would invoke homophobia necessarily, because that means that the primatologists themselves are are somehow afraid of male male sexuality. Which, I mean, to me, like you, that's that's going a step further than I would be willing to step. Victorians, sure, but no one since the '60s has been afraid in primatology anyway to discuss it. And uh, my next door neighbor at UCL was. Volker Sommer, do you know Volker? He's uh, a German primatologist. The name sounds familiar. Yeah, he wrote his one of the sort of big tome on uh, homosexuality in nature, right? So yes. I would look him up if you're if you're looking for evidence uh, of people talking about male male sexual behavior. But I was like, sure, you Volker has he worked in Nigeria and the Congo and all those places. Okay. Um, so anyway, I guess my point is just you know, like it feels like we're we're honing it. We're not throwing the whole thing out because natural selection is still true, you know, in essence, right? Like, yeah, there are parts of it that we need to tweak, but I would, I, I would step back from saying we're going to reconsider the whole model, you know, um, does, does that sort of make sense? I like that in Rough Garden's intro to uh, Evolution's Rainbow, she explains this really well, that we're not trying to just deconstruct and poke holes and break the whole thing down. But once you kind of deconstruct and see what stands and what doesn't, then you can rebuild on it. So example, so what holds in bats may not hold with primates, but once we see where it holds up and where it doesn't, then we can better tweak, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I mean, that's how science works. It refines, right? I mean, I feel like that's part of the process of science. I don't, I wouldn't say we're 
you know, overthrowing anything, to be honest. I mean, like, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a little overstated to say that we're like throwing the whole thing out and deconstructing it because what we're really doing is saying uh, the basic model holds, but there are factors that change, you know, like gorillas versus not gorillas, right? That That's a factor that's causing this in all likelihood, right? The competition, which is why chimps, probably why chimps are so aggressive because they have to be, right? That's a, an adaptation to an environment where they have fewer resources, which bonobos just... Right, they're uh, in the Elysian fields. They get to do whatever they want. Oh, and also about the homophobia thing. Come to my talk on Thursday because I'll talk about that and Jane Goodall's influence in particular on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not saying that there weren't people who are homophobic. Don't don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that in primatology, at least since the 70s or 80s, uh, I mean, people are looking for for that anyway. Yeah, but that's where the building on the earlier kind of categorizations is what in some cases help made us miss it in chimpanzees not miss it but like remark on it and not classify it the same way we did in bonobos but that's thursday's talk right but i mean well okay yeah sorry <laughs> go ahead other people should ask questions i have a question so when you talk about the foundations of like going back and like reevaluating these populations what kind of like outlook do you have or have recommendations in terms of like, should the foundations of primate behavior or in general, like wild animal behavior, is it a new foundation like in and of itself or is it recreating in the context of like how we have like no natural environments and there's no primate population who's untouched these days? Yes, well, that actually, I have a chapter about that. Okay. <laughs> but uh, that's one of the things that again, our we used to, at least in anthropology, want to go out to like, here's the most untouched rainforest and study primates and their natural behavior. And then what we've realized is it's not just that we have so much more human encroachment now that we do, but then also there's always been human influences. And so we're all dealing with different kinds of anthropogenic habitats. And I think kind of getting away from a simplistic, like natural, unnatural, and instead looking at the continuum of how has how have humans influenced them just as any other animal in their shared ecology kind of helps us move forward there. Uh, so I should send you that chapter because yeah. I think that explains it better than I can right now. <laughs> Thank you. So um, in one of the earlier slides, you had mentioned how like um, bonobos, I guess in particular, or like maybe all primates, they behave differently when they know they're being watched. So this could be even in the wild. And um, I mean, I know that they have a good memory, but, and this is like a very specific, tiny question, but like, if you set up something like, uh, like game cameras or something, so just like video observation, no people around, but they can still like smell it. Um, do they still behave differently or do they remember like, hey, a person put this here? Like, is there a memory correlation there? So, so that's a really good question. It'd be really interesting to see if uh, some researchers kind of tease that out. I do think with some of the populations where they're putting cameras out, it's to remotely observe where uh, they're not habituated. So if they put the cameras up when the chimps aren't around, mm -hmm. then hopefully like, the chimps are probably going to notice this is a weird thing. But that I think will allow us a way to kind of observe them without that human influence. And there's actually a lot of really cool technology going on right now to like apply AI to analyzing their gestures, their vocalizations. So I think that's really gonna move so much of our animal behavior research forward. We are at two o'clock. So just to be respectful of folks time, we don't have to leave the room right away. We technically have it until 2.15. So if you have questions, you wanna hang around and ask uh, Dr. Rodriguez, assuming that's okay, we will but we'll go ahead and just sort of formal round of applause. and. And Thursday, 4 p.m., RLL 101. That's where it's going to be. <laughs> All going to be drones in the future.